so what did you do this week? Um, I just, well, considering this is te- technically dropping the same week as the last episode, yeah. I am just going to throw it all in. I just got back from Indiana, visited mm-hmm. my family. I spent a whole week out there. It was wonderful. I got to see everybody, got to catch up. Um, and honestly, we just spent most of the time indoors just hanging out. Uh, which is what I wanted because right. I, I hadn't seen them in a year. I was like, I don't want to go and visit friends. I don't want to go and do a million things. Like, I just want to spend time with you guys. Yeah. So um, I actually managed to go back on the week of homecoming somehow. Oh, wow. So I was... Did you get to be homecoming queen? Yes, just like I did. you always wanted? For the first time. <laughs> um, no, but my youngest sister, Kylie, was uh, cheer- is a cheerleader. Mm-hmm. And she was giving her all up there. She was whipping her little red hair around. She was doing her jumps, her kicks, everything. She was living her best life. Nice. Um, so I did go to those events. I went to the homecoming parade, the homecoming game, um, and all that fun stuff, which was fun. So that's what we ended up doing. Yeah. Um, and before that, I was in DragCon New York. Mm-hmm. And I had a lot of fun there. What did I do there? I just walked around. I had a good time. I don't really remember it. I never remember DragCon. <laughs> we go <laughs> we're drinking yeah. all day we go from 6 a.m to 2 a.m go to bed wake back up at 6 and go to 2 a.m again for mm. like four days in a row so yeah. my mind is just fried afterwards and there's no memories <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true i don't think you've ever really remembered anything you come back with pictures but you're like yeah i'm like i don't remember taking like, um, this but i don't know when that happened i don't know when that happened uh <laughs> you talked to me like once while you're out there and it's oh you know what like i did do i remember one this is why i don't remember what i did except for prior to doing this so i smuggled in an entire bottle of bacardi uh-huh. i went and i bought like one of those big like smart waters uh-huh. walking down the, str- the street in new york not the street the sidewalk just mm-hmm. poured it out you know <laughs> went to a liquor store bought a bottle of bacardi nice. then i just casually got on my knees on a sidewalk while everybody in New York's passing me, just <laughs> dumped the Bacardi into the water bottle, mm-hmm. walked the block up, threw the bottle away, and smuggled a whole bottle of Bacardi into Dracon. Let me tell you something. In a water bottle. The vodka, rum, in a water bottle, best trick ever. It's Because they're Whatever. not going to be like, I need to smell your water. Oh, yeah, nobody ever does. No, no. You go into a family reunion, fill that water bottle up with vodka. I'm teaching how people how to be alcoholics. Take a Gatorade mm-hmm. bottle, fill it up with red wine. The, Who would ever suspect uh, that? I feel like the red wine might be a little hard. No, I did it. <laughs> my God, my, the vodka in the water bottle, that was like my go-to. The second thing that I would do is I would get a Coke with like some nips and I would fill Yeah, just up. fill the nip, like, fill know. the Coke up. Nobody's yeah. going to suspect that. Yeah. Although <laughs> one time I did, I was like drinking at my parents' house and like somebody went to grab my Coke and I like, was like, no, not that. That's my Coke. I, like, I don't like germs. <laughs> I remember um, I had a vodka, I did the same thing except it was like a seltzer water, mm-hmm. like a lemon seltzer or something. And I filled it with vodka, like it was, still had some, so I basically made a vodka soda in a, yeah. in a bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I set it down and I walked away and I came back and, there, and uh, somebody at the booth was like, so, um... <laughs> I got a special <laughs> surprise today. There was like somebody that was working the booth with us and they were like really thirsty. So they went to take a big swig of the water and just got They're a like, wonderful surprise. Uh, yes. That's like the worst thing when you really are thirsty. Mm. There, the amount of times I've done that to myself where I've like, <laughs> <laughs> I've made like spiked drinks and I'll have them somewhere and I'll come back. I don't know. Maybe I put them in the fridge. I don't know how this happened. I used to live crazy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I come back to get like a drink of water later and I'm so dehydrated and I yeah. take a big swig and it's just vodka fills my mouth. Yeah. Worst feeling in the world. The one, That's the one downfall. Of, well, the one downfall of alcohol. There's a couple, <laughs> but the one that is like. You may be an alcoholic. It, do, eh? <laughs> it does not quench your thirst no matter how hard you try. And trust me, I tried many times. I would be like stubbornly dying of thirst and be like, I'm just going to keep drinking this whiskey until it quenches, until it gets me right? too You're drunk like, to care. It's like two in the morning you don't want to get out of bed and all you have next to your bed is the bottle of whiskey that you keep there (laughs) jesus christ if this is your life uh you really should get help though because i'm going to tell you that normal people don't sleep with a bottle of whiskey or vodka by their bed i used to have two bottles of wine in my bed a bottle of whiskey Mm -hmm. next to my bed and a bottle of orange juice next to my bed with a cup that i would make screwdrivers with uh same it wasn't screwdrivers though i just had a bottle of vodka next to my bed at all times also the (laughs) amount of times that i woke up and i had passed out with the drink spilling over me 
<laughs> oh my god! Like uh, every time I'd wake up, I'm like, God damn it! <laughs> That's just waste right there. <laughs> That's right. Then you bring your shirt out trying to get the the, the amount liquor. of times I woke up in the morning and I was thirsty and I just grabbed that mixed drink that I'd been sitting there all night and <laughs> chugged that. Yeah, oh God, good stuff. <laughs> Um, but now that we're done telling you how to ruin your life with alcoholism, um, welcome to your queer story. <laughs> the podcast that inspires peace, mm. love, and radicalism. And we are your host. Um, I am Evan Jones. And I'm the fabulous Paul Hobbs. And uh, we're happy to be here. Mm. We're dropping a surprise episode. We screwed up. We basically went a whole month without recording. Yeah, basically. We um, did. Yeah. So we are making it up to you guys in the best way we know how, producing more great content. That's right. What We're else could you want from us? Putting ourselves in your ears, in your body, and refilling. You've been depleted, and we want to refill you. You can still be queer in September, even though we didn't promote it to you. Yes. Um, if you haven't already, we would really appreciate a five-star review. You can review yes. us on iTunes, on Google, on Stitcher. It literally iTunes wherever you doesn't li- exist anymore. Oh, uh, Apple Podcasts. Yes. Wherever you listen to your podcast at, please leave us a review. If there's no review system, leave us a comment. If there's no comment system, go to our website and comment. Share. I'm Share asking, the episodes. Yes, I'm asking a lot of you right now, but by you doing these things, it allows more people to listen to our podcast, which allows yeah. them to feel more comfortable in their own skin, to learn history about people that are just like them, and um, to have fun. Yeah. I think we're pretty fun to listen to, personally. We are pretty fun to listen to. And we're going to, and I, like, I'm i really looking forward to October because we have a lot of fun topics. Like, well, I mean, fun, also kind of dark and gruesome because we want to stick with the theme. But Listen, still. we need those downloads. We're going towards <laughs> true crime. That's right. <laughs> That's this, the real don't worry. We're not gonna we're not turning into a true crime podcast only for the month of October, just because we wanted to give you guys some dark and horror. It's on theme. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and who doesn't want to hear some spooky shit in ho- in October? That's like, the no, whole fucking right? point of the exactly. month. Exactly. That's yes, it's all about gruesome gore, blood, guts, uh, who killed who. Um I was gonna say what's your favorite Halloween movie, but um I don't Mine would literally, and I don't, I, this is so unoriginal, but it would be Hocus Pocus, but that's also because I cannot stand any kind of scary movie. You know what mine was? Halloween Town. Oh. It's like a cheesy fucking Disney, I think it might have been Disney, if not, it was always on Disney Channel, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure, like, it's like a, I don't know, something you watch when you're in early teens. Okay. Um, maybe, I don't know how relevant, like, I don't know if I would watch it today as an adult, yeah. Um, but I just remember when I was a kid, I would always look forward to watching that every year. They had like three or four different ones. Huh. I mean, might I, be something I feel like I've you would heard enjoy this it. before, but I don't know what you're talking about. You would about. enjoy it. I, I probably would. Is it, as long as it's not it's too not scary. scary. Okay. Cause it's like, like Hocus Pocus is my threshold for scary. And yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like that level of scary. All right. All right. I could do that. I've been trying to watch more horror films though. Um, but I've, I've found that there aren't any good horror films if, I mean, that are like modern, like if you really want to watch something scary, you kind of have to go back. Yeah. And to me, I don't really get scared by much. So I kind of have to look for something more gory and then it's just scary because it's gory. It's not scary because it's scary. Yeah. And I, I, I can't find a good, so if you have any really good scary movies, let me know. See, I, I, I really do appreciate appreciate a psycho thriller like um psycho thriller i i appreciate a thriller but i don't i don't do supernatural i don't do gore but like but that's also why i love i'm a big hitchcock fan that's why mm-hmm. our puppy was named hitchcock because uh alfred hitchcock just like the way that he did things so if you've never seen if you like old you could always watch psycho mm-hmm. um also dial in for murder is a really good one so that's what i will watch in in uh I like when I watch a scary movie, if it's anything supernatural or ghost or like monster, like it doesn't scare me because I know that those things aren't real. The things that will scare me are like, this is a doctor who you go to see him and he kills you or he like rips your teeth out and like (laughs) cuts your wrists and like injects you with poison while you're in his chair. That's what'll scare me. That's why you get hyperventilating whenever you go see the doctor. That's why you're so scared. I'm I'm chill. No, that's why I hyperventilate when I get my blood drawn. If I have to get my blood drawn, it's at least a 30 minute process. (laughs) I remember last time I went, uh, the guy saw me and he was like, oh great, my first appointment. That was literally (laughs) what he said. And And I was like, wow, thanks. 
snacks. Wow. They have to take me to a special room. They bring me snacks and drinks. They lay me down. They have a full blown oh conversation God. with me. And then they're like, okay, turn your head now. And I turn my head and then my body instantly tenses up. It's this poor phlebotomist probably hates me every time he sees me come in. <laughs> oh my God. I just um, can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah. No. Speaking of which, that's coming up. My yearly checkups in November, so better start preparing now. <laughs> Get mentally prepared. <laughs> I need to go. I I've not gone to my yearly checkup yet, and um, it was supposed to be in February. So I got to really get on that. I'm really awful with all things medical, and it uh, Samantha finds it appalling. She really does. <laughs> no, I'm terrified. I'm fine at the dentist. Like they'll be drilling uh, in my no. teeth, and I'll just lay mm-hmm. there and be like, "So how's your day?" Like I'll fall. I almost fall asleep at the dentist every time because oh, I'm so God, relaxed. No. Oh no. Had laser eye surgery. Almost fell asleep. I was so relaxed. Bring me to get blood drawn. Nope. <laughs> wow yep no can't do it That's or weird. shots can't do shots no you'd never be able to take testosterone no i wouldn't no hope your levels stay good hopefully <laughs> <laughs> if they start to drop paul's like i guess we're going the other way folks <laughs> everybody Pretty get much. on board this is paula <laughs> <laughs> basically all right um so we should probably talk about our second half of the history of monogamy and polyamory and this week we actually get to talk about polyamory and if you haven't heard the first half it's not necessary but it it, i think it's really good it's something you should listen to because we talk a lot about um not only the history of monogamy and polyamory but we talk a lot about um relationship health yeah i think that's a good way to put it we talk about things you should discuss in a relationship and and our opinion because our opinion is the best opinion, uh, how you should <laughs> act opinion. in a relationship. Yeah, we talk a lot about that, and um, and then it helps you. It helps you understand why um, polyamory is a thing, and like why monogamy is a thing, which is right. a big thing for me. Like when you understand, even in the queer community, I find like a lot of prejudice against people who are polysexual, and which is very shocking because that's kind of how. So I feel that in the queer community, at least in the gay scene, I can speak for Mm -hmm. that most people are polysexual. Yeah. I wouldn't say I don't want to say most. I would say that most people are outwardly or putting on a front that they're polysexual or actually are like it's perceived that the gay scene is very sexually fluid. It's not fluid, fluid, sexually open. I wouldn't say that the that they're polysexual, but like we talked about in the last episode, they're forced into this role because I mean, it's becoming more normalized now, but especially in the past, you kind of like you just got sex where you could, right? And so, it, like having a relationship where you settle down and live with someone was very hard to do, and few people did, and people just kind of resigned themselves to the fact that this is how we have to live, right? And then built on that, though, it was glamorized. Yeah, it was. Well, because you you flip it, right? Yep. You're forced into this role, so you're like, I like this fucking role. I'll do this fucking role all mm-hmm. night. And, and, and that's okay. It's again, it's not that it's bad, but then it's hard to like, know like, are people polysexual or are they just expressing in the cult in like culture that they're able to? Right. Because nobody wants to let anybody be themselves. Exactly. So except for am us, I, <laughs> except for us, <laughs> am I starting this episode? Yes, you are. Okay, good. Um, so on our last episode, we dove into the history of monogamy and non-monogamy in civilization, civilization's past. We covered the four forms of monogamy, social monogamy, where two people commit to building a life together, marital monogamy, where two people enter into a lifelong commitment to one another as social partners, genetic monogamy, two parents who have children only with each other, and for sexual monogamy, the practice of two people committing to only have sex with one another. We pointed out that in studies done in over 1,200 cultures and societies, only 186 were monogamous in all four areas of monogamy. And in truth, full monogamy is a Western practice developed and enforced by monotheistic religions, specifically Christianity. Surprise! Yeah. However, the lack of monogamy in other cultures around the world is not the practice of polyamory. While these cultures may be, what? While polygyny. these cultures may be polygyny, polygyny, maybe polygenic. Oh. While these cultures may be polygenic, when one man has multiple female partners, or polyandry, when one woman has multiple male partners, or both, the concept of polyamory is a lifestyle created by and for Western culture. 
Because of the heavy emphasis and restrictions of a monogamous society, polysexual people have worked to create an ethical and safe culture to express their multi-love desires. In other areas around the world, the separate environment would not be necessary as most cultures are very fluid in terms of social, genetic, marital, and sexual experiences. However, Western society has forced poly people to define their lifestyle. And we want to add once again that polygamy, in all its current Western forms, is a religious practice rooted in misogyny and sexism and is not part of the polyamorous lifestyle. So keep that in mind, polygamy and polyamory are different. Yeah. While the term may simply mean a multi-marriage, in its current expression, it means something much different than polyamory. Yeah, so and again, I'm stressing that. So we're talking about polyamory, which is the lifestyle. So every person who's, like we said, in an open relationship or sexually experiences, that doesn't mean that they're polyamorous. Polyamorous is a, is a you can be polysexual, that could be an orientation, but polyamorous is a lifestyle that you consciously choose to live and be a part of. So again, like you just saying, oh, I'm polyamorous because I'm in a threesome, that doesn't mean that you're polyamorous. You, you might be a part of a thruple, but you're not polyamorous unless you abide by the codes and the ethics of a polyamorous lifestyle. So what is polyamory and when was this modern day lifestyle first presented to Western civilization? According to the website morethan2.com, the definition of polyamory is the fact of having simultaneous close romantic relationships with two or more other individuals viewed as an alternative to monogamy, especially in regards to matters of sexual fidelity, the custom or practice of engaging in multiple romantic relationships with the knowledge and consent of all partners concerned. Despite new laws and social prejudice against multi-partner relationships, people have continued to People had continued to engage in polycentric romances throughout the 19th and 20th century. However, they had done so underground, which was mostly due to the same sex and queer individual pair-ups rather than the fact that multiple people were in love. Anti-sodomy and sexual deviancy laws played a strong part in keeping poly couples private. So like you said, like it's not so much that you are with multiple people, although that was looked down upon, but... If you're with multiple people and you're two men together or two women together, that's when you run into problems. Right. And I don't understand why there are any sex laws at all. Ever. Right. The thing should, the, the only sex law should be like that both people have to be adults and consenting. Yep. Period. I mean, I don't know. I can't, I'm sure there's some weird off thing that could make sense as a law, but that should be the basis. Are you both adults and are you both consenting? And do you know what you're consenting to? Because that's exactly. a big thing too, because a lot of times people think they're consenting to one thing and they're not. So like you're both fully aware and consenting to all parts of this. And that's and yes. the only law. Yep. You're not raping the matter. other person. Yep. Okay, good. Go have fun. <laughs> good talk. In 1929, famous philosopher Bertrand Russell released the, the book Marriage and Morals. Russell was an incredibly complex and controversial figure and his book read the same. In one chapter, he, support, he supported the aberrant practice of eugenics, which is the process of eliminating those in society deemed undesirable, often through death or sterilization. The idea is that by removing these individuals' abilities to reproduce and thus eliminating their so-called defective genes, we will eventually achieve a master race. And if that term sounds familiar, that is because the concept was the basis of the Nazi extermination of Jews. So needless to say, Russell's support of such a practice is heinous. On the other hand, he was known to be incredibly generous and charitable. In the book, Marriage and Morals, Russell became, becomes one of the first men to openly oppose rape and marriage. And remember, marital rape was not made illegal in the United States until 1993, but 64 years earlier, Russell had written, Marriage is for women, marriage is for women the commonest mode of livelihood, and the total amount of undesired sex endured by women is probably greater than marriage, in marriage than in prostitution. Um, and can we just say about this whole eugenics mass race mm -hmm. thing? What makes these assholes think that they have the perfect fucking genes over everybody else? Oh, yeah. Well, see, so, I mean, this really started with the, um, with evolution. When evolution, when Darwin, like, came. I, yeah, I totally get that yeah. concept. But what makes these assholes think, like, my genes are better than this race's genes? Yeah. So, therefore, my genes should stay and their genes should go. Well, I know. I agree with that. I agree with that. that that's it's the arrogance of being like, well, okay, well, let's find out, like, because the survival of the fittest. So we're like, well, who among us is the fittest? Mm -hmm. And they will all be the fittest. But there's always going to be a weaker person. Like, 
not everyone can be the fittest. But, you know, and but the eugenics didn't start. I mean, the co- concept is heinous, mm-hmm. but it didn't start. It wasn't these weren't like it wasn't first proposed by evil, bad men. Bertrand Russell was actually a good man, but they, people just believed that, like, we've got to we've got to get rid of the the weaker people. And they didn't like most of these men didn't like uh, condone taking everyone out and shooting them, but they did condone sterilization. And that's why you see a lot of um, black people and people of color were sterilized in the United States because of this eugenics law. And then, of course, we know what eventually that led to. But yeah, the, the entire concept, but it still goes on today. There's still people that believe in the eugenics bullshit. Oh, absolutely. Like white supremacists. Yeah. And I also want to point out the his his um his comment though on women where he's like um the total amount of undesired sex endured by women is probably greater in marriage than in prostitution. And that was true at the time. Absolutely. Like, you could you as a woman, you only had you basically had your body to sell. They just called it marriage. You mm-hmm. know. So naturally, his views on marital rape were not well received. Neither were his thoughts on non-monogamy, where Russell proposed that this was not immoral for people to explore sexually outside or within the bonds of marriage. He believed that our monogamous society must evolve with the times and continued to teach and elaborate on this point long after marriage and morals and his philosophical teachings had earned him a Nobel Peace Prize. You Okay. Yeah, I'm just blown away that somebody who fucking <laughs> supports eugenics won a Nobel Peace Prize. But the thing is, if you read the writings of the time, the majority of scientists supported eugenics. It wasn't until they started to see what supporting this belief did that folks were like, oh, shit, maybe this is why we should support. Like, there was like a natural thing after Darwin came out with the theory of evolution and people are just like, oh, obviously, we'll just create a master race. I it could sounded never so have good. in my mind ever thought that eliminating or sterilizing a, a group of people was a good idea, no matter what science said. Yeah. Well, I just couldn't. I, I don't know. Maybe it's called being a decent human. I think so. But I also think that we are hundreds of like over 150 years later and um, part of that, well, not with Birch and Russell, mm-hmm. but 100 years later. And part of that is also look at the way people in general were looked at back then. That's I mean, true. This is right after slavery um, that Darwin presents his theory. Women don't have rights. Um, Latin Americans don't have rights. Like, no, few people in America have rights. The straight white guy is still mm-hmm. the only person that have rights. So we're still in this mentality of some people are better than others. Right. You know. But I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's crap. But again, this is... Like we were, we're like just a few decades away from owning people. So Mm -hmm. it's folks like eugenics. That sounds great. So uh, Russell wrote in 1936, the difficulty of arriving at a workable sexual ethic arises from the conflict between the impulse to jealousy and the impulse to polygamy. There is no doubt that jealousy while in part instinctive is a very, is to a very large degree conventional. In societies in which a man is considered a fit object for ridicule if his wife is unfaithful, he will be jealous where she is concerned, even if he no longer has any affection for her. Thus, jealousy is intimately connected with the sense of property, and jealousy is less where the idea of property is absent. In the meantime, if marriage and paternity are to survive as social institutions, some compromise is necessary between complete promiscuity and lifelong monogamy. To decide on the best compromise at any given moment is not easy, and the decision should vary from time to time according to the habits of the population and the reliability of birth control methods. So just a really long way of saying that, like, jealousy stems from thinking that you own someone, which that I don't think that's all true, but, like, that's what he's proposing, mm-hmm. and that we have to evolve as a society on this issue. So, despite his efforts, Russell was eventually and ironically deemed too immoral to teach in schools and universities, though he did continue to travel and speak. With the boom in sexual research spurred by Alfred Kinsey's in by the oh by Alfred Kinsey with the boom in sexual research spurred by Alfred Kinsey's 1940s and 1950 publishings, followed by the sexual revolution of the 60s and the queer liberation fight of the 70s and 80s, one might think poly couples were safe to come out of hiding. But sadly, they had a new foe, the gay and lesbian movement. In an effort to prove they were quote-unquote normal, white middle-class gay and lesbian activists wanted to present a traditional front. Again and again, transgender, gender nonconforming, queer people of color, leather and BDSM, and polysexual people were silenced and ignored. 
Fear and prejudice swept gay and lesbian alliances as they worried the movement would be seen as too radical if others had a voice. So it should not be much of a surprise. Um, the term polyamorous would not even be publicly introduced to the world until 1990. And it was coined by a witch, a witch named Morning Glory Zell Ravenheart. That is a witch name. But mm-hmm. yeah, I just want to pause on that. So um, again and again, and this is the ongoing argument in the queer community. And we've talked about it a lot on the podcast of the the white middle class gay and lesbian movement versus the queer liberation movement, which was made up of people of color, poor people, trans people, uh, leather and BDSM, polysexual people. And, and even today we still see it. Like you can see in different parades. Like if you go to the Boston, um, pride parade, you see this very traditional white, um, family oriented parade. It's done at like noon or something. And then you go an hour away to the Providence parade and you see a very different story. Yeah. Um, and so there's still this battle. Like some people are like, we have to present a traditional front so that we'll be accepted. And then there's other people that are like, fuck that. We don't want to fit into their boxes. We don't want to conform. We can do this without them. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> but back to morning glory, Zell Ravenheart. Ravenheart was born in 1948 and given the name Diane Moore a fitting Christian name for the baby of strict Pentecostal parents. However, the religion was not for the young woman who rejected it when she was 17 after reading the book Diary of a Witch by Sybil Leake. So watch what your kids are reading, folks. (laughs) It's the gateway to hell. (laughs) That's right. Morning Glory changed her name and joined a local commune in Oregon. She began to study the dark arts and soon entered into an open and pagan marriage to a hitchhiker she met. That sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But the marriage ended in divorce a few years later when Morning Glory fell in love with a wizard named Tim Zell. The two also maintained an open and multi-partnered relationship, usually with five to six lovers bonded together. After the Glory-Zell union, Morning Glory took over editorship of the group's neo-pagan journal Green Egg around 1969. The priestess would oversee the journal off and on for the next 32 years, and it was through this magazine that the editor introduced the concept of polyamory to the world in an article titled Bouquet of Lovers. She had a crazy life. She she had a she had a different life. That's true. <laughs> but no, that's what I meant. Like yeah, it was like exactly. wild. It was full of events. It was yeah up and down. It was definitely not over. boring. Not traditional. Yes. <laughs> uh, the article. The article. The article. The article shot the magazine back into the public eye after it had been fairly dormant for over a decade. With new terminology and the budding internet, people were able to come out as polyamorous, and that movement saw a breakthrough. Uh, One of the first online groups was established by Jennifer Wesp in 1992 under the Usenet forum ATL.polyamory. I don't know what that is, but I looked up a picture of it, and it looks very early 1990s internet. I I mean, this is baby, baby internet. Mm Mm-hmm. So there's probably like when you moved your mouse cursor, there's probably like a calendar or like a clock that followed <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, where it just like, it there, like every time you move it, there's like a spin yeah, wheel. Yeah. Music played in the background. <laughs> By 1995, poly people were establishing so many connections that a flag representing the group had been created and the term polyamory had been submitted to the Oxford Dictionary. Further evidence came in the form of the popular book, The Ethical Slut, which we spoke about in the last episode, Mm -hmm. which was published in 1997 and written by Dossie Easton and Janet Hardy. However, we see the prejudice of the time as the authors felt safer using a pseudonym, which is why the first first edition bears the name Catherine A. Lists on the cover, the book discussed on the cover. The book discussed polyamory as more than the mere act of sleeping with multiple partners. It presented a moral and ethical lifestyle to the general public. So the book was, it was huge, especially in poly worlds. I mean, um, it got like mixed reviews in the, in the um, regular media, but still the, for anybody to be talking about a book about polyamory at this time was big. This is 1997. This is like, I think the year that Ellen came out as gay and like lost everything. So like, obviously it wasn't like the general public was like right. super excited, but people were buying the book. Like everyone's pretending that they don't care or that this is, this is immoral. And of course going to the whole, see, like we let the gays come out now look at this. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, but, but the book was selling and it, you know, it's done very well. And that is what separates polyamory from any other form of non monogamy back to the ethical lifestyle. In 1999, the Oxford dictionary did accept the proposal of the word polyamory and stated the definition as such. 
the practice, state, or ability of having more than one sexual loving relationship at the same time with the full knowledge and consent of all partners involved. Today, the definition has simplified to read the practice of engaging in multiple sexual relationships with the agreement of all people involved, and there is an added note, open marriages and polyamory can work well for couples who communicate well. So I don't know if that's supposed to be like a disclaimer. It's a fucking dictionary. <laughs> Why? Like, um, <laughs> by the way, you might want to talk about it. Exactly. I just, it's just weird to me that they're putting that in there as if someone's going to be like, I'm suing the dictionary because they told me that there's polyamory <laughs> and I got in a polyamorous relationship and now we're divorced. <laughs> so the most commonly quoted ethics in polyamory are fidelity and loyalty, communication and negotiation, honesty and trust, dignity and respect, and non-possessiveness. Poly individuals understand that jealousy is a part of every relationship and work to combat that. One term used in the polyamorous world is com- compersion. Is compersion, which is used to express joy at a partner's joy in another rel- relationship. Every group of individuals may have their own terminology, but some other co- commonly used terms are such. Triad or quad, this refers to the group, Triad means a relationship involving three people, where quad means the same, only with four people. How the individuals date each other will vary from group to group. In some triads or quads, everyone dates each other, everyone dates one another. In other triads quads, the coupling may be more defined. Some individuals will date everyone in their group, but only fluid bond with specific people. Fluid bonding is the act of not using protection during sex. And I can't stress enough throughout this how different it's going to vary from person to person. So like the the morals and ethics are the same, but as far as your triad, your quad, or like some people even have more in their group. Um, But those are the most common ones. Like you, again, that doesn't mean that everyone's dating together. There could be a a couple together and then they each have their own boyfriends Mm -hmm. and girlfriends. And then, um, but then there may be four people that live together and they all, you know, like they all engage in sexual intimacy or you might get different things. Like you have a romantic connection with this person. You have a sexual connection with this person. Yep. Some poly people use a higher hierarchical. I put this word in here so many times that I can't say it. Some people, mm-hmm. some poly people use a hierarchical method, a hierarchy for their lovers while other individuals may not use this method method. <clears throat> Those who use the hierarchy levels rate their relationships in order of importance. For instance, a married couple would usually place their spouse as their primary partner. Then each individual would choose a secondary and sometimes a tietary partner, which is three. I learned a lot of words. How couples navigate this again varies from group to group. Sometimes a primary partner will have veto power on their partner's other relationships. Usually the term is simply used to establish boundaries and guidelines for other lovers. So like, look, we can have a connection, but if you try to come between me and my primary, we're going to have to cut this off. Mm -hmm. Um, Another term used by both hierarchical and non-hierarchical quads. Oh my God. My mouth just doesn't move like that. I (laughs) I need to do some tongue exercises, maybe suck some dick and like work out my muscles. Paul's shaking his head. Yeah, probably. All right, but uh, another term is used is nesting partner, and this specifically refers to couples who live together. And while that fact may not establish a level of importance, it does exhibit a level of entanglement for all parties to be aware. So obviously, if you're living with someone, it's going to be different. Like, I live with this person, so if you don't like them, that's going to cause a lot of problems right. for us. <laughs> you know. It is also important to note that sex is not the foundation of polyamorous relationships. Like any other romantic relationship, polyamorous couples become involved for the same reason. The difference being that these couples are also involved with other people. And depending on the level of comfort and desire to explore, some people may continue to have casual sex, while others will remain committed to their triad or quad. Jesus. While others will remain committed to their triad or quad. What is essential is honesty and communication. Whatever rules and guidelines the couple or group agrees upon, the individuals involved should comply. As with any monogamous or non-monogamous relationship, what erodes a romance is not sex or dating, but rather lying, cheating, and possessiveness. So uh, there was a show, and it's probably still on there, it was on Amazon Prime. I don't remember what what it's called. It's polyamory something. I'm moving stuff around. It was polyamory something, and it... um. And I really liked it because the first season, the first season was like, it was this couple, this quad 
that where they all were experienced in polyamory, they had been in polyamorous relationships. Some of them have been in polyamorous relationships for like 20 years. Um, and this, and they liked the way they explored. And then there was a triad of people that would basically, they had just all kind of fallen in love and they were just starting to explore polyamory. Like they had been together for a little while, but I liked it because it just showed the different ways. Cause we're talking about, you know, <clears throat> like it's what the rules of the group agrees upon. And it shows a very difference where these experienced people in polyamory have such good communication and understanding of each other and their other relationships. And this triad really struggled um, to like come to terms with that. Like one mm -hmm. of them wanted to date someone else and the, and the other two were having a hard time with it. Um, the second season got really stupid, but the first season was really good. I liked it a lot, but it just made me think of that. <clears throat> so over the last 20 years, there has been an explosion of information and exposure to polyamorous communities. And with this has come a mixed bag of reactions. Since its publication in 1997, the ethical slut has been published three, has had three, ah, the Ethical Slut has published three editions, several hundred thousand copies, and been adapted into uh, the play Multiple O's. It's also been translated into a couple um, uh, languages. In addition, several more popular books on the subjects have been written, such as More Than Two and Opening Up, along with a host of others. Television series have featured polyamorous relationships and dozens, dozens of movies have been made. One of the most recent and our favorite tells the true story of the creator of Wonder Woman. The movie Professor Martson and the Wonder Woman is excellent as is currently available on Hulu. And I loved that movie. Loved it. But of course, there has been pushback. In the fight for marriage equality, one of the most common <coughs> arguments used by opponents was that same-sex marriage would open the door for polyamorous couples. And we can't have that now. However, why? Sadly, the queer community often denounced poly practices in an effort to protect and distance themselves from the fallout around the issue. As a response, many poly people have pushed to have polyamorous defined as an orientation, but even well-known gay activists such as Dan Savage has declared, polyamory isn't something you are, it is something you do, an idea that once again reduces polyamory to nothing more than sex, which further allows for the discrimination and limitation of polysexual people. Which it's true, polyamory is a lifestyle, but polysexual. And I think that's kind of like the, the people are getting the language confused. Right. Like pe po people are polysexual and they're like, this is a, um, this is an orientation. This is how I've always felt. I've always felt like I need multiple mm -hmm. uh, romantic and sexual connections. And he's saying, you know, and he's using polyamory and saying this is something you do. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think that if that's what needs to be classified to get people to be able to have multiple relationships and be protected under the law and that's what should happen mm -hmm. you know vice media reported in 2016 the many obstacles poly people face in america and around the world for instance in connecticut outdated zoning laws restrict the number of unmarried adults who can live together in both alabama and, yeah right <laughs> i'm how does roommates work then? I, I guess it doesn't. I don't know. But it, the thing is that law has been traced back in other states to specifically keep poly couples from living yeah. together. Um, in Alabama and Florida, laws are still in place that, criminal, that criminalize adultery, making it dangerous for polyamorous married couples to engage with their quad or triad. Now, how strictly that's enforced, especially in fucking Florida, who right. knows? But it's just the idea that um, adultery is illegal. Yeah. <laughs> In Australia, a social worker was fired simply because she listed herself as a poly-friendly therapist. And of course, this doesn't touch on the social prejudice and discrimination that polysexual people face on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why adding it as an orientation would be so beneficial in protecting the rights of poly people and poly couples. However, even the polyamorous community is divided on whether on whether to classify being polysexual as an orientation, despite there being an evidence that suggests non-monogamous pe uh, people experience higher levels of testosterone and sex drive. Still, some suggest that establishing polysexual as an orientation would limit the concept of multi-love. The argument as a whole is very similar to the argument in the queer community about how marriage legalization might change the LGBTQ lifestyle and queer lifestyle has evolved, but that is not necessarily a bad thing. Regardless of disagreements among poly people, the fact remains that they deserve equality and protection, but still the argument is made in the LGBTQ movement that condoning or endorsing polyamory will cause other queer groups to suffer the, con the conservative backlash. 
What we must ask ourselves is how long will we sacrifice the equality of others for our own gain? Yeah. And I remember that, that, that conversation and, um, you even hear it today in queer circles where like, um, people didn't want marriage equality to pass because they're like, that's not what it's about. I don't want to be like, I don't want to be reduced to heteronormative standards, but then also it's kind of nice to be protected and have, yeah, I want all the same rights as everybody else. Exactly. Man, Samantha and I filed for our, um, or what you call it, or uh, the as married, and we both like got a nice um, like cut in our taxes because of that. That's nice, you know. I bet I yeah. well, mm-hmm, I want a tax cut. Yeah, that's right. Get your get your boyfriend on board. Um, but yeah, I mean, if that's the whole thing. And more importantly, like if like one of us passes away, the other won't be able to take care. Yeah, like, you have protection over everything. Exactly. There's so much more involved. There's so much involved in that. And poly people want the same thing. So who cares if you want your one partner by your bedside or you want your three partners by your bedside you should be able to have the people you you won't be cold in the winter that's right so as we bring this series to an end we do want to point out that of course polyamory isn't for everyone monogamy has worked for many people in societies throughout the centuries though certainly not as well as some would have us believe ultimately an individual should have the right to explore and express themselves how they choose provided all parties are of age informed and fully consensual Furthermore, we cannot stress enough the importance of open communication and honesty. If you believe you are polysexual but your partner is not, then it is not right nor fair to expect them to change for you. Our advice would be to go to counseling, educate yourself on the ethics of polyamory, and decide how to move forward. Many of your recommended resources were listed throughout the episodes, but we will list them again uh, with even more. If you are single, we strongly recommend the third edition of the book, The Ethical Slut. If you are currently in a relationship and looking to open things up, then we recommend the book More Than Two by Franklin Vo and Eve Rickert. Both of these books are very accessible. If you don't like books, then check out the long-running podcast, Polyamory Weekly, available on most podcast platforms, or you can watch the Amazon Prime series, Poly Love. There's also countless videos and even TED Talk panels on YouTube that are great that are great to check out expert esther peril has several talks and also hosts a podcast and if you uh, just want to get hot and sweaty then make sure you watch professor martin and the wonder woman on hulu and as a side note if you want to see the abuse and distinct differences of polyamory versus polygamy there is an a e series on netflix titled escaping polygamy that really shows the neglect the neglect and realities of these misogynistic relationships and yeah. also there these resources are worth checking out just so that you can help support the polyamory community. Yeah, yeah, be Just informed. Just educate yourself. Yeah, exactly. Be informed. You know, you, maybe you're not polysexual, but again, the same thing. Like, just because, we, you know, we have friends who aren't queer doesn't mean that we don't want them to um, support us. Also, most poly people identify on some spectrum up here of queer not peer of <laughs> queer maybe not every single one but a lot of them do i mean so the these are members of our community and like we need to support them so i mean the same way we want people to be educated about us we want them to be educated and those are great resources to educate yourself but um but yeah so um stay yeah. queer don't get a lobotomy we love you our little allied hookers and our little succulent sapphists and our proud homocrats and go um have yourself a quad or triad sodomy circus this weekend or any weekend live your life how you want to live it that's right as long as everybody involved in your life is consenting <laughs> exactly as long as you're not forcing people and as long as you're not a dickhead who's Um, marrying six women but not letting them express themselves in any other way. So goodbye. Bye.